Hi, everyone, and welcome to Signature West Podcast. And my guest today is Lauren Finkelstein. She is the CEO and the founder of a nonprofit called Save One Person. Hi, Lauren. Hi, Sam. How are Thanks you? Thanks so much for having me today. My good, pleasure. how are you? I'm good. I'm good. All's good. So you are the CEO and the founder of a nonprofit called Save One Person. What is Save One Person? If you want to tell us what that is. Save One Person, each week we had, each week in the media, we highlight one person who needs a living organ donor or a medical miracle. And we use the media to save lives. Instead of using the media to destroy, we use the media to help save lives of people in need. Okay, so let's back up to, to, to connect the dots here. Um, you're from New Jersey, uh, born and raised, I believe. Yes. And how did you get involved in the media world in the first place? What, what got you involved in the media world and fell in love with it? What made me fall in love is when I was a kid, I went to go see movies like E.T. and Star Wars and Steven Spielberg, you know, the director. Um, I, I was fascinated with his work and I wanted to be a director uh, oh, nice. to create films like that. But that never, that never happened in my life. But I did fall in love with the magic of, of TV and film and being able to create something from nothing. And that was magical and mystical to me always. And then it what- It still is. So, and then what did you do? I mean, obviously you went to school, you had to get some academics. What was that like? When did you start? So when I was 16, I took a TV production class, which was my first foot in the door there. And then I went to the University of Miami in Florida and I took television production and I had an internship right after that with MTV and I worked there for several years. And then I freelanced for a decade or so um, at various networks creating 30 second promos to promote various news or entertainment type of shows. And then comes this misfortune event that you were surrounded or you were very close to in Israel when you have witnessed the suicide bomber event that took place. What happened then? Right. I was, uh, I was standing in front of, or I was a couple feet away from the, from Sabaro's restaurant, pizza restaurant in Jerusalem. I was with a friend and we were supposed to meet some other people and they were late. So I can't recall if I said or she said, you know, let's not wait here anymore. That was probably the best decision of our lives because when we started walking, we were perhaps a half a block away. We heard a very loud explosion and being that we were in Israel, we all knew what that loud explosion was. It's and automatic, uh, right? it's automatic. it was very... It's, it's automatic. Especially you, in Israel. Right. When right, you hear right. that sound. Right. It's you just, you just know. Right. And, uh, you know, an, uh, a thing about when you hear a bomb like that in Israel, the fear is, is that there's multiple bombs because quite right. often uh, when there's one bomb, sometimes there's other ex bombs planted. Uh, for me, what happened was I froze. Some people take different, you know, have different reactions. The person I was with, luckily she went into commando mode. She was directing us where to go. For me, I froze. I couldn't think, I couldn't move, but I did have one thought. And that thought was, I don't have a child. I don't, I don't have meaningful, meaningful work. If I left this earth today, I left nothing behind that I could be, um, that's eternal. And, uh, and, and actually uh, what happened, is, an interesting thing is, I was explained later that I went into a gamma brainwave. So everything- What, what does that mean? What, what I was so mean? shocked that it, it's, I'm not gonna give it justice because I'm not a scientist or doctor, but 
your brain start. Well, what happened was my brain just everything slowed down. It was like everything was in slow motion. It's it's your brain waves go on a different frequency. There's a different, you know, like uh, like uh, theta maybe like that. Okay. Uh, but gamma is very quick brain waves. So quick. What, however, it affects the body that um, I couldn't. Everything was slow motion. It was a very bizarre feelings. I've asked numerous people why that occurred, and, and that was the explanation. So after that... But my body was definitely in shock. So after that event, what happened? What did you do? Because I think it, shortly after that, there was not 11 episode. I think like two weeks right. later. So what actually happened, which I didn't mention last time, was right after that suicide bomb, I started drinking a lot of alcohol. Oh, nice. <laughs> like two, three weeks. I did Landmark Forum. I started just drinking in the day. And, and then a friend of mine uh, encouraged me to do Landmark so, Forum. So hold on. So, you, so, so hold on one second. So you had two things happening. You felt your life is not meaningful. You don't have a child. You, you're not doing anything with, with work that's meaningful. And then you also decided to, to, to drink um, well, it was just, it was the process of figuring it out. It right. was, it was, you know, everybody reacts to trauma differently, sure. but what gave me clarity was right after the uh, suicide bomb in Jerusalem, I actually, a week or two later, so it wasn't a long period of time, maybe it was two weeks, I did Landmark Forum, which gave me clarity uh, of a of a new way of being, so to speak, or to create possibilities, and then that was in uh, the World Trade Center. I think it was the first the the last couple of days of August and the first couple of days of September. Or, right. And then September 11th happened, and then I reached out to my mentor at the time, Rabbi Simon Jacobson, and I asked him what I should do with my life. And he said, use your TV skills to help other people. And I actually, from years prior, actually had an idea that I never put pen to paper, right. which was instead of promoting these silly things like OJ Simpson and um, Cindy Crawford's bathing suit, to actually use TV to highlight in a 30 second spot somebody that needs life-saving help that you could actually improve his or her life. Right. And I put pen to paper. I submitted the proposal to Rabbi Simon Jacobson. He said, I love that idea. And I'll let you do it through my nonprofit, which is the Meaningful Life Center. And it was, a, at the time, it was called a project of the Meaningful Life Center, Save One Person. And it was in for, you know, 18, 19 years. And then we started branching off doing new things. Like we created a store, an app, you know, like a dating right. app, but for people who need living organ donors, got involved with a, a company who's actually growing parts of an organ in a lab. And uh, recently, in the last year, we created our own 501c3 uh, charity, even though we've been doing this for 18 years mm -hmm. or so. So now you're, now you became your own sort of, uh, that's when the birth process came for uh, Save One Person. Yes. It took its own life. So walk us through an example of some person, a child or an adult, I don't know, in Nebraska um, or in Vegas, that they need an organ. Where did uh, it start? How did so, they reach out? What happens step by step? If, if, some, if somebody reaches out, what happens? Yeah, um, how did they find how, So how usually you know? someone contacts so it, it all depends. We, we've had paid advertisements on television. Uh, we've had, you know, when we've appeared on TV, people have reached out. But every week to the media, I've compiled a list of over the years of thousands of media stations. And every week we do an email blast of someone who needs life-saving help. So people no, but often let, but, but if find out up, about us. Let's back up a little bit. If somebody, you know, God forbid, somebody, a child or a person, in a state in, in Vegas or in Nebraska, and they, 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 they were told they need to find a donor. What, did that, how that, what that should that person do to start the process to get to you? And how does it go from there? 
So they could just write into save one person under uh, contact us. Right. And we have a section on our website. It's uh, uh, where you can fill out your information okay. and you contact us. And quite often I'll give them a list. Not only will we, we highlight them in our save, weekly save one alert, uh, but we will give them other resources of people who have been successful in organizations of getting organ donors. Um, so they just have to contact us. It's very, very simple. And then we can, you know, and then we can publicize their case to find a stranger to be an or living organ donor and or we put them in touch with other organizations who have had success finding organ donors. And what's the, like a time, I don't want to say time limit, but what's your, there's a time for you to reach to that, the goal, which is finding a donor, does it take, is it a forever process or is it just maybe a case by case? Unfortunately, it's like dating. I'm going to give an analogy like dating. Right. It could be one date or it could be a lifetime of dates. Um, this, I mean, we've had success stories in as little as two or three months and we're still searching for uh, donors, for people we've been looking 10, 15 years. Wow. There was, uh, there's one story, I don't, there's one story that is heartbreaking, but yet very uplifting. Um, we've been looking for or living organ donor for this man by Steven Scarduzio in New Jersey for years. And, and what happened was uh, we finally got him a donor. We got him to the hospital and in the hospital, I won't say any names because I don't want to get Right. in trouble, right. but they did a switcheroo. They said, well, would you mind going into a SWAT program? Now, Stephen never got his kidney, but the SWAT program, they matched, uh, they took this woman's kidney and it, it facilitated eight different living organ donors matches. But Stephen never got his kidney, uh, unfortunately, and we, we're still looking for him. So it's, you just do your best you can and wherever it lands, it lands. The girl I was telling you about in Israel, you know, there's a girl in Israel that, can I tell the story or? Sure. Uh, for the 11 year old girl. So one of my favorite success stories, and it only took, I mentioned, cause it only took two or three months was we were looking for a kidney for a man by the name of Richard Wound Tyler who needed for years and 1010 News in, in New York City picked up the story. Uh, it was post, that story was also posted on the web from 1010 10 Wins, CBS News. And where was and he, where was, where was he at, where was he at, the, the person in need? He was in Brooklyn. Okay. Okay. He was in Brooklyn, but you know, with the internet, it makes the world a very small place. Right, right. So, uh, the, CBS posted the story online. A woman uh, in London uh, read the story, volunteered for Richard, but insurance wouldn't pay for her flight over. But we asked her if she would give a, the kidney to a child in um, Jerusalem. And she said, yes, and insurance did pay for it. And now the girl has a functioning kidney. She's totally healthy. And that took two or three months, which is which, the shortest amount which, of time. That's, that's nothing, right? Two, three months is nothing. Nothing. Right. It happened very quickly. And, and then there's someone like Stephen, who we've been looking for years. But I believe, you know, God has his own plan and we can only do our part. Right. But the answer is, who knows? So what's your big picture vision for Save One Person? Obviously, it's a big um, ship to sail. Uh, what do you need help with and what's your big picture or your big goal if, 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 you, if, if you would say, if you have 60 seconds to say it, what would that be? Okay, so what we need help with is funding. So right. if anyone wants to make a donation, we would love a donation. We also need to help with media, getting out our urgent request on our website out to the media um, all over the world. And our big vision is that every single media outlet should start their own Save One Person unit, meaning they collect information of people who need life-saving help 
and they broadcast it to their own audiences. So that media is now used as a life-saving mechanism. And it's not only when there's an intriguing story, it's a weekly time allotment to use media as to save a life weekly, if not daily. That's our big picture. How and we, I'd like to say, are the mothership. So you would be the mothership and you would have like children, let's call them children, children in every network worldwide. Did I get that right? Exactly. Thank you, Sam. Okay. Yes. That now is now I understand. Now that, I understand. Those are our children right. that will grow up to be adults and there'll be thousands and millions of lives saved and media is transformed to good. I hear you. I hear you. Lauren, thank you so much for this information. I certainly learned a lot. Um, I wish you all the best with this endeavor. Um, I know it takes out a village to, to do um, um, a to run a nonprofit and to be to to get something of that scale to the masses. So hats off to you guys. Um, all the best to you and um, keep at it. To the audience, our listeners, I hope you enjoyed this. If you want to reach out or if you want to uh, uh, assist in any way you can, Lauren, it's saveoneperson.org, correct? Correct. Correct. Great. So thank you again. And everyone that's listening, please join us again next week for a new episode of Signature West Podcast. Stay safe, everyone. Thank you.